Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in this world, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the managing editor at DevOps.com, and I'm the moderator for today's event. We have a great webinar of, on tap today with uh, lots of really interesting uh, topics and information. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if at any time you miss any or all of today's event, um, you will be able to listen to it on demand post-event. You'll be receiving a hyperlink in an email that will take you right to the event. And we are taking questions from the audience. So at any time, if you have a question for our speaker today, um, just use that control panel and we will uh, hopefully get to as many questions as we can in about 15 minutes before the end of the event. Okay, with that, I would like to go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Containers for Grownups, Migrating Traditional and Existing Applications with Red Hat. I'm excited about this because I love the containers topic. Our speaker today is Scott McCarty, who's Senior Container Strategist at Red Hat. Hi, Scott, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for joining me today. I'm gonna go ahead and put myself on mute and just let you go jump right into your presentation. All right, well, thanks for having me. So um, we're going to start, uh, you know, about, probably about half an hour, 40 minutes of content here. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through a lot of what we've learned from probably about four years of experience with uh, containers and putting applications in containers. Uh, David, next slide, if you wouldn't mind. So the first question that comes up is why migrate? Right, and so I'm gonna dig in just a hair on that. Next slide, David. So if you walk through kind of the history of how all this happened, um, and I think this is probably pretty common for most people's journey into containers, right? We all heard this, it's similar to cloud, it was exciting, we kind of heard all this buzz around it, and we said, okay, well, let me download some stuff, play with it, experiment a little bit. At some point, you find some application that's a quick win, um, and that could be a web app, typically, or, you know, first one. In my case, it was actually just reading man pages from a different version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux because it was four years ago and RHEL 7 was still brand new. And I, I had the epiphany, oh, this is, this is really cool. Um, I can now run different versions of software very easily without mucking my system. Um, and then the next question that happens, and this is kind of when it goes into production, you look at, you start to say, hey, what else can we containerize? What else can we win with? And where else can we save, uh, you know, energy and basically make it easier to deploy things to production? Um, at that point, then you start thinking to yourself, you start, you know, all of these are kind of in a loop because as you inventory your apps, you start to say, well, which, which container platform, what, you know, what format, what makes sense, what can I do, uh, you know, that would give me the biggest bite out of all of my applications, you know, inventory of applications, and then you start to do it. Um, and so that's kind of what the path looks like from the last four years till now. And different, you know, if you're different people are in different phases of this path, but this is kind of, honestly, it's kind of what we do with technology. It's what we did with Unix to Linux. It's what we did with physical to virtual. And now we're kind of doing it with, you know, I call them traditional applications to containerized applications. Next slide, please. And so there are really three different options as you move things to containers, right? There's the option of lift and shift, uh, which is kind of what we have done historically with most things, right? We, we just move them over like, you know, we had in, in the Unix to Linux world, we basically moved apps over, um, typically migrated the data and started a, you know, a new version of it on a new operating system. It's what we also do when we upgrade operating systems. Um, the other option is if, for example, we have a system that's no longer SMEs around, or perhaps it's got some restrictive licensing, or perhaps it's just old and nobody wants to touch it and it's scary, we'll often augment the system by writing new front ends and things like that. So we're putting new faces on mainframe applications is a common one where there's a lot of data in the back end and we're not gonna touch it anymore. The same is true even with Unix and Linux and other apps that are five, 10 years old, right? There's a lot of the time where we don't want to touch the old thing because there's no more subject matter expert around that wrote it or even knows how to manage it, so we just don't want to touch it. Um, and then the third option is to rewrite from scratch. And you know, depending on where you're at in the phase of the application, this can make sense. Um, rewrites are always risky, um, so there has to be a pretty good ROI. Uh, these are common for web apps where you're hunting new revenue 
you know, where it's a new app that you're experimenting with um, or something that maybe is, you know, not done all the way. Um, but, but I would say that rewrites are typically the least common one. So I'd go from left to right, probably common to least common. And so I'd like to go to the next slide, please, David. And so you look at these three options and say, well, what's the problem, right? Uh, well, the problem is, is that basically every piece of software that we have was written before containers were invented. So if you even look at Node.js and the latest, greatest, Golang, and of course C++ and Java and .NET and all of these other languages, um, whether they're you know, traditional applications that you'd run on your desktop or they're web apps, all of the software and infrastructure, and when I say infrastructure, I mean things like compilers, interpreters for the languages, databases, uh, middleware around, you know, caching layers, things like this. All of these things were designed before Linux containers were around. And so, next slide, please. We have to gain skills around migrating, you know, things into containers. Even if we're building an application from scratch, um, you know, and it's a brand new app, it's really a migration to an extent because we have to learn how to use those tools within containers. And so really the same skill set applies whether you're migrating an app or you're building a new app. And so I'd like to go to the next slide, please. And so it happens again. Um, you know, you have to basically listen to your app, right? Uh, uh, just like we did, I mentioned before, with Unix to Linux, physical to virtual, and now containerized apps, we have to kind of listen to the app. That's that's a, a phrase I heard one of our performance engineers say a long time ago with, with performance in it. It was catchy because you really have to base it on whether your app makes sense to put into containers, technically and business-wise. And uh, I'm going to dig in now in the next section a little bit more into the technical pieces. So we could go to the next slide, please. So I want to I want to go through some uh, first, I'm going to go through some guidance, and then after that, I'm going to go through some case studies. So, so next slide, please. I think it's useful to analyze the applications from three main kind of top-level domains, right? From an architectural perspective, from a security perspective, and a performance perspective. And these are pretty attractive usually when I talk to customers because most people are looking for a framework about how to think about migrating these applications. And we had these... We had these same frameworks again before when we went from Unix to Linux and physical to virtual, and now we're trying to create them again for containerization. So please go to slide 10. Um, so, so the most basic, uh, I, I kind of try to break this down in its most basic form, and I'm going to dig deeper with, with the number four, but you basically need to be able to break the application down into code configuration and data. And you'll notice that most Unix, Linux applications, that's pretty easy with, with them. Um, so I took, as an example here, I just use MySQL because it's something that a lot, a lot of people are familiar with, especially if you've done any web applications, any LAMP stack development. Um, it's a very clean architecture in that, you know, there's code, it has a binary, it has a configuration file, and it has a directory where there's data. Um, when you start to think about other applications, they're not so easy. Um, there are often applications that may dump data in many different directories, have many different config files, and maybe have several daemons that start. And some of these are proprietary, some of them are homegrown. But you can start to imagine in your mind, okay, I can see how it gets harder from here, but this is the easiest case and sort of the most crisp case that we can show you. If you can break your app down into code configuration and data, then it might be a good candidate to put in containers easily. So please go to the next slide. And so I extended upon this. Once you've, once you've kind of done that very rudimentary check of code configuration data, you can start to think about some other things. And I try to break it down into a sort of a level of effort matrix, right, between easy, moderate, difficult. You see, I'll walk through code configuration and data first. So, um, you know, in, in the MySQL scenario, right, it all fits into the easy category. So its code is completely isolated. It's a single process. Um, it's got one configuration file. It's got one data directory. Um, its secrets are easy to manage because they're built in the system. Um, you, it basically connects over TCP, so actually it, it, it can be a little bit more difficult. Um, it also it has you know packages and source, so that's easy. And um, it's open source; there's no licensing restriction, and it's easy to restart. You know, it doesn't it doesn't corrupt itself very often when it restarts. And when you think about Apache or Nginx or you know a lot of the modern web app type software and infrastructure. So you think about MongoDB and a lot of middleware, 
uh, you know, Java stuff, JBoss, things like that, they're they're pretty easy to put into containers because they they match all of these criteria, right? There's pretty simple configuration code and data. The secrets are understood. The network connections are understood. Um, the installation is well understood. The licensing is open source, and it, and they're easy to restart without corruption. But as you get further to the right, there are other applications. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we've looked at things like network installers from proprietary companies, you know, proprietary software. It gets more difficult, right, because there's installer scripts and things like that. And if you can, for example, I'll take installer as an example. If you can reverse engineer the installer file, you can kind of figure out where it dumps things. You can figure out where it puts the code configuration and data within the system. Then you can probably reverse engineer how to make that into a container fairly easily. But if you can't, it gets a lot more difficult. You know, you end up in a lot of reverse engineering. And typically, again, that happens as things get more restrictive and proprietary. So, you know, you might not even be allowed to make a container image of a piece of software. Or you may need to think about that as you're releasing that software to your customers if you're an ISB. Um, you may think about how you need to change your, your or think about your your you know, policy of how you distribute software, because if the customer is going to have a container image of that software sitting inside of their, you know, on-premise environment and then being able to deploy it on production nodes at will, you know, you may have to think about how to entitle that or license that. So I don't want to go super deep into this because it could be an hour just talking through this slide, but I wanted to at least provide you guys with kind of a chart that kind of gives you a framework for what to think about. Uh, as you're putting things in from an architectural perspective. So now let's move on to security, my next slide. So this is another one that I think a lot of people don't have a framework within which to think about it. And so we came up with the tenancy scale. So, you know, people always ask, well, are containers secure enough? And I love to walk through this example, you know, because we've gotten this warm and fuzzy feeling around virtual servers. And we're, we're confident that that has enough isolation for most of our needs. But I'm actually going to challenge that idea a bit because let's take, for example, what I typically see in enterprise customers. They'll have a VMware environment, for example, or a virtualization environment. They'll have SAP and Oracle databases for their customer resource management, you know, running in this cluster. But in that same cluster, they will not run DNS and web servers. They'll have a separate VMware cluster that happens to be connected to the outside world that is, you know, on a public network that has DNS and, a, and web servers and, you know, all kinds of external facing uh, stuff. Even, even with virtual machines, you have to think through the entire network, the storage access, all of those things. So I'd argue actually virtual server level tenancy is not actually good enough between certain groups of applications, right? Uh, typically, if we look at internal and external facing applications, it's right down the middle of this tenancy scale. We'll typically put, you know, we want physical and, and rack level isolation between internally facing apps and externally facing apps. Um, and we will typically say, okay, well, it's okay to have virtual server level tenancy or isolation between SAP and the Oracle database. That's common. Um, same is true on the front end side. So if we have a web server, um, typically we're okay with virtual server level isolation between the web server and the DNS server. Um, and so the same is true when we start to talk about containers and containers get installed in a way that's very similar to a, a, a virtualization cluster in that we typically use OpenShift or Kubernetes um, and you have you know, instances of Kubernetes slash OpenShift. And so you will think, well, if I have internal facing applications, I may run for example, the DNS and the web servers in separate containers, and maybe that's good enough because those are both external facing, and that might be enough isolation. Um, those will still get scheduled on, you know, often different virtual machines within the, the OpenShift cluster, but, you know, uh, container level isolation is good enough. And so we kind of, it, it really helps to have this framework to think about how to divide your apps up. And then one final one I'd like to add here because people always ask about what does the far right mean? Well, often, even in a containerized world, right, you will still have a disaster recovery copy of your application. It's, it's, it's often common that you need data center level isolation. So even if you're running, for example, OpenShift in one you know, zone in a cloud provider, you want to run a separate copy in a separate zone or in a separate data center completely. And so, you know, you need separate data centers with separate weather and, and earthquake patterns, you know, and that, that kind of level of isolation. It's kind of the maximum you can get on this planet. We could put a, 
data center or a cloud provider on another planet, but that probably, you know, that's still a ways off. So the idea here, though, is that you can kind of use this tenancy scale for your main application to kind of understand where it needs to be isolated from other applications and groups of applications. You can also use it to kind of understand how to isolate your disaster recovery copies. So with that, I'll move on to the next one. I will move on to performance. So performance is kind of the next dimension that people start to ask questions, right? And I wanted to show a chart. Actually, I, I, I boldly stole this from, from a, a, an excellent performance engineer we have, Jeremy Eater. And uh, I, I, the only thing I think I added was that I made these additives. So you could think about everything at the end of the day at some point runs on bare metal, right? So even if you're in a cloud provider, you're on open stack, you're in containers on open shift, um, you're at some point you're adding these technologies together in some way. And so it is possible to run containers on virtual machines. It's also possible to run virtual machines in containers. In fact, Red Hat, uh, OpenStack uh, does basically run, you know, their, their virtual machines in containers. If you think about it, they run them in SE Linux and in C groups and things like that. So they're kind of running in containers. But the long story short is, you know, if you want the best of both worlds, you kind of have to combine them. So, you know, for example, you can't run, I'll walk down this, you know, this, the speed uh, of containers is pretty much from a runtime perspective, almost identical to bare metal. So you get really fast performance, um, but, but then you lose some features. So you don't have live migration. You don't have um, deployment of different, you know, alternative operating systems. For example, you cannot run easily a Windows container on a Linux machine or vice versa and nor would I recommend that generally, um, even when there are pieces of software that allow you to do funky things like that. Um, still, virtualization is probably the best way to do that. Um, and so I kind of look, you can kind of see as you add containers from left to right here, you know, you kind of gain all the best of both worlds. You might trade off a little bit of disk IO latency and maybe a little bit of network latency and maybe a hair of deployment speed, but you get alternative OS as you get live migration. And so you want to think about kind of what, what, what capabilities you need for your cluster. Like, so for example, if you have an OpenShift cluster and you want to live migrate the master node around, right? You're like, okay, that's something I might want to be able to do, right? I might want to install it on bare metal and have multiple masters, or I might want to s install a single master and have it be live migrated around inside of a virtualization environment. But you have to decide kind of whether that makes sense for your environment. Um, and in a cloud provider, you kind of always end up in the far right category. You kind of end up with containers on virtual machines no matter what because most cloud providers rent VMs. There are way to get, ways to get bare metal, but typically, typically you're going to be you know, essentially renting virtual machine space. So with that, I don't want to dig too deep, but, but I at least want to give you, again, some framework, ways to think about throughput, latency, and even some discrete performance, you know, like the deployment, uptime, and alternative OS, which I consider discrete. They're not, they're not you know, linear performance, but they are still performance characteristics. So with that, I will move on to some use cases. Uh, and I'll go on to the first use case. So let's walk through a very common one, actually. So this was actually a customer of Red Hat's, uh, actually someone I co-presented with. Uh, Chris Collins kind of walked through this at Summit a couple years ago. Um, you know, WordPress is a perfect example of a web application. It's got a ton of users. It needs to scale. Um, you know, the problem becomes painful with WordPress sites is that you need to, you know, when you get to the scale of what this is, 8,800 sites, 29,000 users, you start running into challenges around state synchronization and being able to scale from server to server. Um, and then also you have separate users that maybe want a development environment, and that can be really painful. Um, so the idea here, what they did was they essentially containerized WordPress and Apache. I believe it was Apache. could have been Nginx. Uh, I can't quite remember. But, but long story short, you, you can containerize the entire infrastructure, so all the underlying software under WordPress, so the web server, the MySQL instances, whatever you need, put those in containers. And now when you need a dev copy, you can literally single command to hit an API and deploy an instantaneous copy of what's in production. I mean, that's, that's, that in and of itself is phenomenally powerful, right? Um, and then knowing that you have exactly what you've modified in dev and then be able to save that into a registry server and then pull it down in production. 
so this is a this is kind of the classic I would call it kind of use case for containers in production and dev and being able to you know making it easier to go between dev and prod and then also handle a lot of users at the same time users that are essentially making content changes which is very similar to de developers use case so this was a really interesting one uh, I'll, I'm going to dig into some other slightly different ones that are a little bit less classic though and that you might not think about so next slide please so this is an internal Red Hat example, and this is an ISV example, basically, um, in that we, you know, we sell layered products on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and other things like OpenStack. So one in particular that's an interesting one is, is Identity Manager, so Red Hat Identity Manager. Um, it's essentially made up of dozens of daemons, and each of them, you know, these are classic pieces of software that always expected to have their own data volumes. They expected to be installed on a regular operating system. Um, it has an installer with logic where it expects to be on a single machine. Um, you know, a lot of the knowledge of how to run this stuff is embedded in, you know, init files, system D unit files. And so, you know, engineering, as they built this stuff, they saved that knowledge over time, you know, hard coded it into the startup. Um, you know, there's, a, and, and there's, you know, essentially extensive, you know, setup needed at the beginning. You have to pass it a lot of variables, tell it things, you know, there's a lot of options to decide on when you go to install it. So this made it fairly challenging to run in production. It also, you know, or I should say to set up in production. You can imagine if, you, if, if and, and this is a real use case that I remember a customer telling me they needed to set up an identity management server in China. Uh, and, you know, they had a really tight deadline. And they essentially moved their IDM solution into a container. And then they were able to deploy it in China with a single push of a button, essentially. And it was, it was, 100% known that it was going to pull that container image down and that container image would run as long as it had a data volume um, that it could mount. So, so you can quickly see like this has really nice delivery, you know, capabilities and that you can deliver to your customer exactly what you know they need with, and you can have a very nice contract between you and the customer in that the customer is not going to go in there and mess with things and change them and tweak them in ways that are unknown. So it's a really nice contract between the essentially or technical demarcation between the, the vendor and the customer. So now we can give you some environment variables that you can set when you when you fire up the container image or the or or, or multi-container application, in, you know, which could be something that you run in Kubernetes with a YAML file. Uh, but but the idea is that you can now demarcate exactly which pieces parts and which features that can turn on and off and what can be configured and what shouldn't be configured. And so now in a support scenario, it's a lot easier to support, um, even if it's remote in China. So this one's, I think, a really good uh, ISV use case example. So now I'll move on to uh, another use case. Um, this, is, this is one that often I see customers and people that are just getting into containers. And it's one that gets ignored by kind of the media, if you will, like, you know, the sexy uh, is all around new builds of applications and and you know uh, agile developed applications and things like that. But and, and microservices and you know things where they're setting up CI/CD. But people often forget that just some of the old stuff that used to annoy us um, is really easy to put into containers and it makes our life a lot easier. So I'll give you an example. Um, this one, the one that that sparked me on this use case was. Uh, we had a customer who was a telco, and they were running a network analyzer in their environment. It was a large environment, obviously, probably thousands of servers on the order. Um, there were some Oracle databases, and historically, Oracle databases are always treated as, you know, the very um, controlled environments, right? We don't want we don't want our network team. If the DBAs have a problem with some kind of network thing, say there's some weird flaky network failure, we don't really want the network admins just logging into our server and installing you know, running install.sh, right, for some piece of software that the DBA doesn't understand, doesn't know, and doesn't care, and doesn't want the network team to actually even install on their server. But the network team is in a bind because they need to install some kind of tool to troubleshoot what's happening in a flaky connection snare. And so this is the classic case of, like, TCB dump or Wireshark, or, or in this case, it was a, a third-party piece of software. Um, it, was a, it was a vendor provided piece of software, and it needed to install through an install.sh. And the Oracle team didn't want them to install it. So they were able to get this software into a container, run it, and now it became really, really easy because now the contract between, the, or the at least understood contract between the DBAs and the, and the network team is, okay, I will have 
I will let you run this container on my server as long as you delete it afterwards. And um, but but you won't pollute the user space of my server or change something by mistake and break something on my Oracle database. So now I can just literally run a single command, pull the image down, run it um, as root because you can't run privileged containers, and that's something people don't realize. Um, you can't. So it's still privileged. It could corrupt the file system, but generally, you know, something like a network scanner is not going to do that. Um, and now when we're done, we just delete it. And so you can do this with you know, something like a network scanner. Red Hat provides uh, the rel dash tools containers, another good example. Um, we actually have an article that I call out at the end here that shows you how to do this uh, with uh, all kinds of troubleshooting around the Linux kernel. You can even instrument the kernel. Uh, um, and so there's all kinds of interesting things you can do without actually installing like symbols in the operating system and doing all kinds of things. So you can keep your oper your production servers very clean and just run some tools on them. And so if you're a vendor that sells tools, this is also an interesting use case. Um, so it, it again creates a better demarcation between you and your customer and allows people to consume it a lot more easily without having to corrupt their, you know, or worry about what might break their, their production servers. And so with that, I will move on to uh, questions. All right, looks like we've got, uh, I think, a couple questions come in so far. Um, actually, sorry, we don't have any questions coming in so far, but it, we do have time. If you have a question uh, for Scott, please just uh, go ahead and use that control panel. Um, and uh, as, as they come in, we'll go ahead and get through them. Um, Scott, can you kind of maybe, uh, while we're waiting, just kind of go through real quick what, you know, where where Red Hat kind of fits into the whole container conversation and, and you know, talk about what you, what you guys are looking to do in the, con in the container space and just kind of provide a quick overview there? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Red Hat has, you know, I would say um, we have, we, we've gotten pretty deep into the container space early. I guess I'll just kind of tell the story. So, so we had OpenShift 2.0, and as we pivoted to 3.0, um, we adopted Kubernetes and as sort of the foundation for, for OpenShift container platform. And so OpenShift is kind of, I would say that's kind of the nexus of all things containers at Red Hat. Um, and then that relies on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which obviously is our long-time solution that we provided to people that needed Linux. Um, and we've created a huge ecosystem around, uh, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And now kind of in this future world, as it's developing, it's developing pretty quickly, we're developing sort of the same ecosystem around OpenShift. And so we're working, we have a program called OpenShift Commons. We have this Red Hat Connect for technology partners. Um, we're really looking to kind of increase, you know, uh, awareness around that and, and help build, facilitate an ecosystem for our ISVs and partners. Um, around you know these platforms and we actually even have a secure delivery mechanism for container images in the Red Hat container catalog um, and so we actually even have the ability to redistribute images and we obviously have to distribute our own images um, for our own products so we've got a lot of experience with containerizing existing apps a lot of experience delivering them and we're essentially just trying to help the world understand it because it's it's a journey yeah. And and it's a neat technology too, and I know it's it's been around for a little while, but uh, I think it's really kind of uh, gaining some speed as far as adoption is concerned. We do have a couple questions that have come in, so why don't I go ahead and start throwing those at you, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully get to all of them before the end of the, the uh, hour. The first question is from Bill, who asks, are containers tested in some sort of pre-production environment before being deployed? Yeah, that's a great question. So typically, customers do set that up. That's exactly um, sort of sort of the elegance of it is that if you you know we've always tested things right historically, even with traditional applications. And I think we we you know pre testing is what's magical and new about the agile world and 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 sort of DevOps right is that historically we just had monitoring in production. So we put into production and we waited for nine one one. We waited for users to call and complain. Then we started adding sort of cameras, you know, like, so I'd call Nagios and System Center and all these other things, like, kind of, those, those were cameras and, move, you know, movement sensors. So we, we detected some times when something went wrong, but we, our best effort was just to figure out when we saw something go wrong, 
um, and do it there. And we still keep those things in a containerized environment. We still have monitoring. We still have the users that will call if something's broken. And there still will be broken things to get through. Mm -hmm. But now we can actually build those container images ahead of time and run them through smoke tests very easily. So we can run, it's not just making sure our code passes tests, which you know we still know sometimes when we put code into production, something strange about the production environment makes it change in a weird way. You know, the way it's consumed is what changed and then things break in unintuitive ways. And so we've always heard the thing, it works on my box. Well, it works on my box mostly goes away with container images because now we have an exact replica of the exact user space that's running in production, except we haven't you know, saved in a container image. We can fire that up in a pre-production environment, even a full-fledged Kubernetes slash OpenShift pre-production environment. And sometimes we even have customers do that on their laptops, all the way down to the developer layer. So you could have an entire copy of a 12 microservice application running in its full glory and regalia you know, on a laptop, change your one service, integrate it back with the other 11 services, make sure it works, and then promote just that one service up to dev and then QA and then prod and have those images rebuilt each time and tested. And by you know the chances of something going wrong by that thing's in the prod, pretty much you've removed every possible scenario where something could go wrong except for security of performance. Because mm -hmm. under load, you might still see some things that are different and obviously you have real hackers in real life. But, but other than that, you've removed all the architectural problems, which is a huge chunk of our problems you know, historically. Okay. Great. Next question is from Thomas. Uh, he's asking, containers can be used to protect apps against attacks. How are messages between containers protected? So in an OpenShift environment, so in certain ways you are left, oh, that's, a, that's a great question. There's a lot of answers to that. <laughs> so in, in, in its most basic form, I say, so OpenShift has, for example, when it's installed, it has encryption between, between you know, uh, nodes. So it installs essentially a, a you know, you, you essentially encrypt the traffic between the nodes. And so, it, for example, if you're running an Amazon, you can have a VPC, you can have, you know, um, there, but, but then there's more advanced ways of doing this. So, so there's, there's a ton of third party, uh, Tigera and things like that. They have point to point solutions where they can literally protect one port connecting to another port and limit which port and encrypt exactly you know, in the way that you want those channels. And I don't know all their features, but, but there are several, you know, third-party vendors that are already providing services like that on top of Kubernetes and OpenShift to provide really sophisticated point-to-point -point encryption and controls like firewalling, essentially. Um, so, so long story short is there's a lot there, but there, but at its most basic form, as long as you keep that cluster private, um, you know, that internal private traffic is only, you know, visible within those clusters. And so it kind of goes back to my tenancy scale. It depends on how much is enough, right? You know, mm -hmm. still you've got to think about is container level isolation enough? If they hack the container or they hack that node, that node they might be able to see all the traffic going in and out of that node. So like you still might want your internal SAP and Oracle apps separate from your DNS and web server apps that are external. Okay, great. Next question is from Andre who asks, do you need to register a subscription uh, for each uh, RHEL Red Hat Enterprise Linux based container? Uh, no, you don't. No, no, it's based on the node. And essentially when you run containers on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you get unlimited containers. There's no registration of them. Um, you do want to run Red Hat Enterprise Linux containers on Red Hat Enterprise Linux hosts because all of that is handled for you automatically. Um, we actually have, I can send you a link if you want to send it out, but uh, we have a document that actually explains that. Um, but the short answer is if you run Red Hat containers on Red Hat software, it works really well. You just under, you just register the underlying host once and then you can run as many containers as you want and they have access to all the content that you want. And you can turn on and off repos within the container if you want and you can manage things the way you want. That's awesome. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Let's see. Um, before I an ask, though, um, just want to remind the audience that there's time. If you do have a question for Scott, um, please go ahead and use that control panel. We still have some questions left here, but uh, just want to put the word out that uh, there's still time for you guys. So next question is from Prashant, who asks, how do you see containers uh, use cases in COT, COTS, and then in parentheses, vendor-provided products. So commercial yeah, well, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we we see a huge potential there. Um, in fact, we see the potential to revolutionize, you know, essentially, or at least evol at least evolve uh, the way this model works. So I, I brought up in the use cases a bit where I talked about, you know, it, it really helps define the, the, the technical contract between the end user and the customer, you know, the customer and the vendor. And so we've seen it even with our stuff. So we've done a ton of development around um, security compliance and essentially controlling what's in that container image. And so we see a lot of focus on, I guess let me say from our side, we want to provide, Red Hat wants to provide a foundation for ISVs to build on top of uh, Red Hat software. So like historically, the way this worked was the customer installed RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and then they installed the third party application. The way we see the future going is probably the vendor installs their operating, you know, their, their, their software on top of Red Hat's, you know, Enterprise Linux operating system in that container image. And then most likely we most likely we distribute it through the Red Hat container catalog for them in a known good state that's already passed compliance checks and security checks and all kinds of things. And so I'd really call it kind of the, the app store model where, where you know you the customer now can consume this and they know the app works. Like if they're running RHEL 7.4 and they download a container image that has a third party ISV app already installed on it, it will just work. And there will be a couple environment variables to fire up that app the way they want and then you know then uh, now, mind you, I want to point out that Red Hat doesn't want any part of the revenue of that. They, we just want to make it secure and performant and easy to use. But there's no, there's no collection of money or anything like that in the App Store model. I, I just want, from a technical perspective, that's how we envision it. Okay. All right. Great. But it's a free process when you join the Red Hat Connect, you know, for par technology partners. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Uh, next question is from Bill. Uh, what skill sets do I need my developers to know to start implementing container solutions? And what was the first part? What what what, what skill sets? Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting one. So like as you, I mean, it's really kind of the same thing they know now, and that's kind of how I've modeled all of my content. I try to add that extra little ten percent of knowledge um, that you need to kind of convert to containers. Honestly, the, the main things you need to understand is that in from when I when I in my presentation really like slide 11. Like those are probably the most important ones to so start to think about, you know, can you split up the code configuration and data? Um, you already know that because it's your app. So really, it's probably stuff you already know, hopefully. Um, and, and you need to start thinking, though, about being a little bit more um, uh, disciplined in like where you put the stuff. So like historically, developers used to be able to just write to a POSIX file system and put things wherever they want. Um, you have to start to think a little bit differently with a container. You have to start to think, okay, when this container gets started, it's actually going to be running in this very controlled environment where the container platform is going to give it a bind mount and provide it one directory or two directories or three directories, or we're going to have to define all those directories. Um, so, so it sounds kind of, I mean, I know I sound like an operating system vendor, but you do have to understand the operating system basics. Like you have to understand the way mounts work and the way network ports work and the way, you know, port numbers work and all these things. And so there's a lot of things around thinking about security and architecture and even performance that you need to think about in a very traditional operating system way. Because now, you know, instead of the Oracle database DBA doing all the tuning, you're probably going to have to do some of that tuning ahead of time and make sure it kind of works and really come up with, very good known defaults that that will just work out of the box because that's what people expect with containers. So it's really a change in the way you think about it more than it's. I know it's strange. It's not necessarily. It's somewhat technical skill set, but it's really a customer driven focus that you got to think about. You have to really consume them as containers and start to get a feel for what it's like to consume software as a container. And that's that's hard. That's. I mean, I won't deny that's something that you need intuition to do. But we we're here to help. All right, great. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, next question is from Jeff. He asks, what would be the simplest method for testing the use of containers to get familiar with how they work in a, in a real sense? Are Red Hat and OpenShift available for download and local testing? Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. OpenShift is available for local testing. In fact, uh, if you want to go play with it, you can play with MiniShift right now. If you just Google MiniShift, you'll find access. We have something called the Red Hat Container Development Kit, which is kind of our official supported way of uh, 
of doing it. Um, it basically gives you a VM that runs OpenShift inside of it, a full-blown version of OpenShift. Um, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of ways to get OpenShift, like official OpenShift supported bits on your local desktop and essentially fired up. Typically as a VM, if you can, I, I find that to be the most, you know, the most efficient way to do it, you know, just to have, that's how I do it because I don't want to pollute my RIP main system and I like to install and uninstall it at times and upgrade and things like that. But, but absolutely is a, is a short answer. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is from Kent. Uh, he asks, do you have a view on the time to create a small, medium, or large VM with Kubernetes orchestrating OpenStack or OpenShift? So I guess he's looking for different times. Yeah, so so we don't, I guess that, I'm going to de dissect that question. So <laughs> we don't yet install OpenStack with OpenShift, although there is the that is, I think it's OSP 14, 15 ish time range. I'm not super close to the timeline on that, but there is, there is the, there is the plan to move the OpenStack install to a container, fully containerized install, and it mm -hmm. will essentially be managed by Kubernetes slash OpenShift. Um, those will be bare metal containers running, you know, all of the OpenStack services, and then the OpenStack services will fire up their own VMs, um, in in their with their own scheduler, separate from from you know OpenShift slash Kubernetes. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, I, wait, what, could you repeat the question one more time because there was a couple pieces in there. Yeah, sure. Do you have a view on the time to create a, um, then he has in parentheses, small, medium, large, uh, in parentheses, VM with Kubernetes orchestrating OpenStack comma OpenShift? Um, Okay, so like, I, I, and I think what you might be getting at is a, an all-in-one install, maybe, of OpenShift running in OpenStack. Um, and and honestly, the installer will run, and I mean, it's got a fully automated installer. Uh, OpenShift does, and so it's pretty quick and easy. In fact, I was running an installer early this morning. Um, you know, give yourself like maybe an hour of messing around. Um, I mean, for an all-in-one install, you know, maybe that tops. I mean, it should run pretty easily if you give it enough resources. It, should, it runs pretty quick. Um, I, I guess I, I don't quite know what you mean by me large. Um, I guess let me say this. You can do an all-in-one install as sort of a smaller install of OpenShift slash, because, you know, OpenShift is based on Kubernetes, so I always say slash Kubernetes. Um, or you could do a three-node install, you know, in VMs. And, again, the same installer works. You just kind of, as you're installing the installer, it asks you some questions and, I'd say it, it takes about the same time no matter what number of nodes you install. Um, maybe a little bit longer as you get into like seven plus nodes mm. or eight plus nodes kind of thing. But but like, you know, one and three are very common and they maybe give yourself an hour. Uh, but if you want to install like a 10 node real test environment that's really like a production like environment, the installer will do that as well. In fact, I'm working on one right now. Okay. All right, great. Um... If you uh, have a question, yeah, there's still time. Um, Scott's uh, going to be here until there are no more questions. So um, uh, just use that control panel and put your question in. And our next question is uh, from Man Manjunath, and I apologize that if I uh, mispronounce your name. Uh, what is the kind of the, the main differences between Docker containers and the Red Hat containers? Oh, that's a perfect. That's a great question too. So. So that gives me the opportunity to talk about something called the Open Containers Initiative. So historically, with like sort of the, the version one and version two of, of container images, they were purely Docker images. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was like kind of what changed everything, right, is this image-based deployment of containers. So historically, if you looked at containers, they were treated like regular operating systems, even though they were even though they were called containers, and they were. Containers are essentially just fancy processes that have a little bit more isolation on them, um, at least in the Linux world. Um, in, in Solaris and other older Unixes, there are actually constructs, but I won't go down that rat hole. Um, mm. But a long story short is they still weren't that magical, though, because, because you still had to, like, click next, 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 and install an operating system, right, or, or kickstart an operating system. And so that was still annoying. I mean, at the end of the day, it would still take you 20 minutes. You know, it was never the VM creation that was the annoying part or the slow part. It was always the get the whole thing up and running so that I have a shell and I can log in and use it. Um, that was part of the, the, the challenge with VMs and, you know, operating systems in general. Um, then when you went to the Docker model, so V1, version 1 and version 2, you know, now I had a command line interface that I could type Docker run, Docker, you know, 
kill docker rm. Um, and the nice part is if I typed docker run dash it, I could literally have a shell. And so you, it was two things. It was a standard interface to running something. So it was like a literally, you know, in an old VM, I would fire up and think about this from an ISV perspective. If I had delivered my application as a virtual machine image, the customer would go fire that up and then they would have no idea what to do. They're like, do I connect to port 2222? Do I run a web interface? Do I SSH into this thing? I don't know what the interface is to get in. How do I change the password? How do I, you know, how do I, how do I, how do I? There's all these questions and it was unknown and it was kind of funky and weird. With Docker v1, you know, essentially, and I'm going down a rat hole here a little bit, but I kind of <laughs> need you to explain it all, is that, is that now that was all standardized, right? Um, now that was like, so now you have Docker run, Docker kill, blah, 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 all that, and you also have a standardized image format. And so now you have both. There was an open community around the image format, um, or I should say there was a community around it. People got really excited about it. The challenge became around V2 is that the world didn't want one vendor controlling that image format, right? They really liked the idea of having a standard interface and a standard image format, but they didn't like the idea of one vendor controlling it. And so, I mean, just being very transparent about the history of this, you know, there was a bit of a rebellion in the open source community. CoreOS uh, proposed a standard called AppC, um, and Docker eventually kind of said, okay, fine, we'll donate our format to something called the Open Containers Initiative. And so now, since version 2 on, and I'd call it almost like quasi 3.0, you know, every major vendor on the planet has essentially committed to this OCI image format, um, even Docker. So Docker donated the version 2 standard, and then now this OCI standard is kind of called a 3.0-ish version of that, and um, call them basically compatible also, like version 2 and, and this new OCI format. So like if you have a tool that says it's OCI compliant, it pretty much just works with anything Docker. There's no guarantees of that right as we speak, but it basically does work because the OCI image standard is based on the Docker v2 format. So so long story short is here, Red Hat still has Docker, you know, upstream Docker components in our software. We still use it for OpenShift today. We are looking at a lot of other tools because of the OCI standards. And there's a lot of drawbacks to the Docker tooling, even though we like the format and the interface. So Red Hat is working on tools like Podman and Builda and Cryo inside of Kubernetes to basically build and run containers with small tools as opposed to having a full Docker daemon running. And so long story short, we see there's still more potential for innovation around those tools, especially now that there's an open format standard. And also, I want to point out that you see the whole world adopting this. So like every major cloud provider, if you build an OCI compatible image, you can push it to Amazon, you can push it to Microsoft Azure, you can push it to Google Compute. Um, you can move it in and out of Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you can move it in and out of OpenShift, you can move it in and out of Mesos or, or you know, any of our competitors. So, so long story short is if you adopt that OCI image format, you are safe because every major vendor is adopting that. And that's kind of where Red Hat's investing. I know that was a really long answer, but it's a complex no, it's great. history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's perfect, and I, I think uh, I think our our audience got a lot a uh, lot more than they bargained for with that answer. But that was great. Thanks very much. Um, that actually is the last of our questions. So um, I do want to thank the audience for sending in your questions. If you have a Homer Simpson moment and you hang up from the webinar and you're like, oh, I forgot to ask him this, just um, I'm just just know that I'm I'm sure Scott will be more than happy to answer any questions offline, uh, post event. Um, also, to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded, so if you missed any or all of it, uh, please uh, don't fret. You will be receiving a hyperlink in an email after the event so that you can listen to it on demand. Um, also, uh, the webinar will be posted on the DevOps.com website. And uh, while you're there, uh, check out the other uh, webinars that are listed on the DevOps.com website. Hopefully, there'll be one or two there that pique your interest. Scott McCarty, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It was a really, really fascinating discussion. Thanks for having me. All right, great. Well, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.